To understand how myosin is going to cause muscle contraction, we've got to understand this thing called the contractile cycle. So in the last, in the last part of the lecture, we looked at sliding filament theory, and we saw how these thin actin filaments lie around the thick myosin filaments. And what I implied is that heads on the myosin, on the myosin grabbed and pulled to allow themselves to move, to pull the thin filaments in toward the middle. And that was how our sarcomere got shorter. And if you imagine hap that happening to all the sarcomeres, the whole structure compresses and the muscle contracts. So how does myosin actually do that? To talk about that, we're going to talk about the contractile cycle. Now, that's going to happen. There's going to be multiple stages in that. And I'm going to draw each stage out. Remember, it is a cycle, so this is kind of going around in a circle. But we'll start at the first stage, which we're going to call rigor. So with each stage, we're going to draw a little bit of actin. And we're going to draw one myosin protein with its head like so. So here, in rigor, the myosin head is tightly bound to the axon, to the actin. And the ATPase on the myosin head is empty. So, you need to know there that this myosin head is bound tightly to one of the actins, and there's nothing in its ATPase. I'm going to shade that actin in so we can keep track of which one we started out bound to. Now, something else I should mention to you here. That myosin head can be in two different states. It can be in a state where it's straight up and down, like so, so it's at 90 degrees, or it can be sort of stretched out, more at 45 degrees. This is the lower energy state. This is a high energy state. It's hard for it to do this. You can imagine that this hinge that that head is swinging, is swinging on is kind of stiff. What I sometimes imagine is a little rubber band. But here it's hanging loose. But if I stretch the head out like that, now it's sort of tense. So I can stretch the head out to its extended position, but then it tends to snap back. So it takes energy to push it out like that, and it'll tend to do that. Here in the contractile cycle, the myosin head is vertical, which is the low energy position. All right, so that, the next thing that happens, we're going to go into the next phase, which we're going to call release. And what happens there is that a new molecule of Adenosine triphosphate binds. That's going to be ATP. This binds to the myosin head. And we are now in the release state. That's the one we started on. I just need to make sure we see that that ATP is now on the myosin head. 
So the binding of the myosin head, the binding of the ATP to the myosin head causes the head to release the actin. Okay. The next thing that happens is the hydrolysis of the ATP molecule. So our ATP is going to break into ADP plus phosphate. I'm going to show that as my ATP has now become ADP and the third the separate phosphate is now separated from the ATP. So that's written pretty small there but it's important that you see that. When that happens energy has been transferred to the myosin head. So the energy from the from that bond in the ATP has now been transferred to the myosin head which leads us to next stage. In this stage, our myos the myosin head is going to stretch out to its higher energy position. Notice that the ADP and the phosphate are still there on the myosin head. That's important. So our myosin head uses the energy it got from the ATP to stretch out to the high energy position. Notice now that it is positioned over a new actin on the actin filament. So. Hopefully everyone's following along there. If not, feel free to pause and go back and look at that. It's a good idea to try to draw all of these as you go. Draw your own picture of each of these, paying attention to every detail. So you're paying attention to, is the myosin head bound to the actin or not? Is there What's in the ATPase? And is the head vertical or stretched out? All right, now, the next stage, what happens next, actually happens in five sub-pieces. So we'll draw those all on here. We'll label them 5A, B, C, and D. I would recommend just watching this sequence. We'll do it down here. Watch it once, then go back and watch it and make your notes as you do it. So 5A, we'll call bind. In step 5a, the myosin head grabs on to an... Oops, that's not drawn very well. Let me back that up. Our myosin head grabs on to an actin. At this point, the ADP and the phosphate are still there. So, step one, grab onto an actin. In step 5B, that separated phosphate is going to pop off of the myosin head. 
the ADP is still there, but we lose that phosphate. The PI, the inorganic phosphate, bing, comes off of the myosin head. That leads us directly to I'm going to go ahead and erase this diagram of the mycin. So if you wanted to, if you want to make sure you've written that picture down, feel free to go ahead and do so. You just need the space here. So in step 5C, which we're going to call snapback, Our myosin head ah. snaps back to its vertical state. When it does, since it is grabbed on to the actin at that point, you can think of it as pulling the actin filament or pulling itself along the actin filament, whichever way you want to think of it. The idea is that we're going grab and then pull. And you could think of it as either this or this. Either way, you're exerting force, moving that thin filament in or moving yourself along the thin filament, whichever way you want to think of it. And then finally, step 5D, where we lose the ADP. And note, at the end of 5D, we are back to the point where the myosin head is tightly bound to the actin, and the ATPase is empty, and the myosin head is straight up and down. In other words, we are back to stage one, rigor. So these four steps, 5A, B, C, and D, are sometimes known as the power stroke. Those happen one right after the other. Hopefully that made some sense. That's the contractile cycle. So you can imagine a myosin protein just doing this over and over. Imagine this, we're in rigor. Let's see, I need a action film. Here we go. So myosin head actin. So we start in rigor, straight up and down. Uh, let's see, I also need an molecule of ATP. Here we go. ATP. And this orange cap is that phosphate. All right. So, it goes sort of like this. Here, oh, okay. Let me actually... Let me make the video a little bit now. Uh, you'll probably just have to watch in the small thing and watch on the screen. So we start in rigor. The next thing that happens is ATP comes along, binds to the myosin, which causes it to release. So now we're in the release state. Next step is hydrolysis. We separate out that third phosphate. They both stay there on the actin. So then ex extension, we stretch out, then the power stroke. Bind, lose the phosphate, snap back, lose the ADP. Now we're back in rigor, ready to go again. All right, so 
and we'll keep doing that as long as we can. So here's the question. What makes me stop? When during this process would I be able to stop this? Because each of these steps follows from the one before, and this whole thing will just keep happening over and over again if that's workable, with this, if the situation allows it. So where can I stop? Well, there's two things in here that could cause me to end this process. One of them is here. We can stop here. if there is no ATP. If there's no ATP available to bind to the myosin head, then we can get stuck in stage one because we can't let go of the actin without new ATP binding to the myosin head. So if there's no ATP, we can't let go. However, that never happens in a living organism. Under any normal circumstances, your muscle cell will never allow itself to run out of ATP. It will stop working before its ATP stores are completely exhausted. There's only one time when a muscle cell runs completely out of ATP, and that's when it's dead. So when the organism dies, and it stops making new ATP, as the ATP levels run out, the myosin heads will get, lat will get latched on to the, to the actin, unable to let go, and my muscle gets to do a state where those thick and thin filaments can't get longer or shorter, they're just stuck. They're rigid. In other words, rigor mortis. That's, how, that's what rigor mortis is. After death, when ATP runs out, the, mus the thick and thin filaments get locked together and the muscle can't contract or relax. Just stays rigid. Now, it's often, people often misunderstand and think, okay, so rigor mortis is when all the muscles contract as much as they can. And that's not really what happens. It's more just that they become locked wherever they are. So I know this, for example, uh, when I was little, I had a guinea pig, Bumble, and one morning I went down to check on Bumble in her cage and Bumble was lying in her little box and I looked in and Bumble wasn't moving. And when I picked up Bumble, Bumble kind of came up without all of her limbs just sort of holding in place like that. She had died and her muscles had locked up and she'd gone into rigor mortis. Now, somebody who knows what they're doing can, based on the condition of a body, the temperature, they can make a guess based on how much rigor mortis is there as to how long ago that body died. Rigor mortis will last until the first stages of decomposition start and the proteins themselves start to break up. So if my thin filament has a myosin latched onto it, that's in rigor, but if you break this thin filament off from the rest of it, well, then it doesn't really matter if it's latched on, and that's when the muscles loosen up after death. Okay, so that's one place where we could stop this process. But assuming there is ATP, the ATP will bind to the myosin. We normally only stay in that rigor state for a tiny fraction of a second. It's just a passing thing. So ATP binds, we come out of rigor. We will then hydrolyze the ATP and stretch the myosin head out. Then if we can, we will grab onto the actin. But that's another place we can stop. You just talked about in sliding filament theory, something which can block the binding of myosin to actin. That's tropomyosin. So here, we can say stop if tropomyosin prevents binding. So if the tropomyosin is in the blocking position, then the myosin will go all, through all that stuff and be stretched out ready to go and then be unable to bind. So it'll, it'll pause there at stage four. And it'll wait until we move that tropomyosin out of the way so it can bind, lose the phosphate, snap back, lose the ADP, new ATP, release, hydrolyze, stretch out, bind, and so on. It'll start the cycle again. And it'll keep doing it as long as that tropomyosin's out of the way. So imagine it working something like this. In my muscle, so what's the normal, what's the state of, say, this arm muscle when it's not being used? Well, the myosin heads in there, most of them are in stage four. They are stretched out with a hydrolyzed ATP, an ADP and a phosphate split up in the ATPase socket, ready to go, but unable to do so because tropomyosin is in the way. So what's going to let us out of that? Well, when my 
brain decides to move that muscle, action potential, actually it starts from the side, down the upper motor neuron to the spine, lower motor neuron down to the muscle, releases acetylcholine, acetylcholine binds to receptors, graded potential, action potential, hits the T DHP receptors, pulls open the ranidine, calcium gets out, calcium binds to troponin, troponin moves the tropomyosin out of the way, and now the myosin can go step 5A, B, C, D. Tropomyosin's still out of the way. New ATP comes in, release, hydrolyze, stretch out. Tropomyosin's still out of the way, okay. Bind, phosphate, bend, ADP. New ATP, release. And we'll keep doing that. Now remember, those calcium pumps are working. So this is going on, but at some point the calcium comes off the tropomyosin, and then sometime after we release, the tropomyosin goes whoop, and then we do hydrolyze, stretch out, and we're stuck again. And since we can't bind, those that thin filament is free to slide back where it was, and the muscle relaxes. So the muscle, the myosin will wait in stage four until the tropomyosin gets out of the way, at which point it will run until the tropomyosin goes back, and then it will stop running. This is kind of a weird way to think of it. We would normally think that when I tell my muscle to contract, it turns on the contraction machinery. But really, what it is is that the contraction machinery is trying to go. And what my muscle does is put a block on it and then take the block away when it wants it to go. This is sort of like driving your car by putting a cinder block on the accelerator, and when you want to stop, get out, run in front of it, and stick a block under the wheel so it has to stop. And then when you want to go again, pull the block out of the way and run around and get in the car because it's going again. It's, it's a strange way to think of it working for us, but it works just fine for your muscle. So, what you get the idea is that one action potential, which caused that release of calcium, will cause several of these cycles to happen. It'll move the tropomyosin out of the way and let this happen a few times, and then move the tropomyosin back into the, into the blocking position, which will then let the muscle contract. What that suggests is that one action potential allows a period of contraction where all the myosins are pulling. Remember, there's hundreds of them on each thick filament, so when that tropomyosin gets out of the way, they're all doing this. And then we'll stop it and it'll relax. In other words, one action potential will cause a cycle of contraction relaxation. Everything you have learned up to this point, all of this fantastic information goes into one action potential. Here, I'll be the muscle fiber. The action potential happens and I say, <laughs> one muscle twitch, a short contraction and a relaxation. And if you're trying to think, what does that look like in my muscle? One fiber going through one twitch is not something you can easily see. Which kind of at this point makes me go, well then what the heck am I learning all this for? If all this went into one muscle twitch and that doesn't even really move my muscle much, why am I learning this? How do I get muscle contraction? How do my muscles work? Is this one twitch? No, that's actually many twitches. How do I pull something and hold a weight up if it's supposed to be twitching? Well, let's talk about how twitches work, and then we'll talk about how we can put them together into bigger scale muscle contractions. Let's talk about a single muscle twitch. So we'll draw a a quick sketch up here. This will be a graph of tension versus time. And we will indicate on here that here, that's where the muscle action potential happens. So that lasts something like one millisecond. So if I graph the tension in a, oh, sorry, I should also say this is in one muscle fiber. So we're looking at one single muscle fiber, one cell, what it's doing over time with, in response to one action potential. And that is that the tension, a, a few milliseconds after that action potential happens, the tension will build up and then fall off. That's one muscle twitch. 
we will have a short, what we call latent period. So what do you suppose is going on during that time? Well, if the muscle action potential is happening then, then all of those other events of excitation, contraction, coupling, the opening of the DHP, the activating the DHP, pulling open the reanidine, calcium getting out, calcium getting to the myofibrils, binding to troponin, moving tropomyosin, all of that is going to happen in this couple of milliseconds. So about two milliseconds. And then we will have a period while the muscle is contracting, and a period where it is relaxing. That is one muscle twitch. How long that lasts depends on what kind of muscle fiber we're looking at. Here I've drawn what we would call a fast twitch fiber, where the twitch duration is about 10 milliseconds. In slow twitch muscle fiber, it's more like 100 milliseconds. So in a slow twitch fiber, we'll do that one here in kind of a kind of a bluey gray. This would be a much longer process. Now, we'll talk a little we'll talk about the difference between them just as a quick thing so you know to begin with. The two things that differ between fast and slow twitch fibers are that fast twitch fibers have fast myosin ATPases and fast calcium ATPases. Remember, these are the pumps on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these remove calcium quickly. The myosin hydrolyzes ATP quickly. The idea being that in a fast twitch fiber, we bind an ATP, it releases, we very then quickly hydrolyze it, stretch out, grab on, do the power stroke, whoop, new ATP, bind, hydrolyze, sorry, release, hydrolyze, stretch out. We don't wait. In slow twitch fiber, on the other hand, we have the slow versions of both of those. Slow myosin ATPase and slow calcium ATPase. By slow myosin ATPase, I mean in slow twitch muscle, we bind a new ATP, release, wait a moment, then hydrolyze, stretch out, bind, pull, new ATP, release, hydrolyze, stretch out. We have this sort of pause in there. It takes it a moment to hydrolyze it, which means how many contractile cycles can you do in a certain amount of time? Well, fewer, because you've got this built-in delay in it. So in my fast switch fiber, I'm going new ATP. In my slow twitch, it's... We've got this much slower thing. So we're not going to build up force as quickly. Now, that's an important thing to remember. So the, my, the myosin ATPase determines how quickly you build up force. The faster the myosin, the more contractile cycles you can do, and so the faster you build up force in the fiber. The calcium is taking the, my, taking the calcium away, and that determines how long we're going to keep that tropomyosin out of the way, which means that the longer the tropomyosin is out of the way, the longer we can do these contractile cycles. So in my fast twitch fiber, while I'm doing the contractile cycles quickly, contractile cycles quickly, 
I'm also taking the calcium away quickly, so I'll block it faster. So it's calcium out of the way, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, cal calcium taken away, and fiber is blocked again. In the slow twitch, it's calcium comes in, tropomycin out of the way, pull. Remember, calcium is slowly being taken away, and then it blocks again. We get maybe about the same number of contractile cycles. It's just in the fast twitch fiber, we build, the, we build up the force quickly and then stop it quickly. In the slow twitch fiber, we build it up slowly and then gradually stop it. So that's the difference between fast and slow twitch fiber. Now, I do want to suggest to you a difficult problem that very well may show up on the test. So, here is an example of a fast twitch and a slow twitch. Remember, the fast twitch comes because it has fast myosin and a fast myosin and calcium pumps. Slow has slow myosin and calcium pumps. But what if Dr. Lugubre, who is a good friend of mine, has this idea? He wants to create a fiber with fast myosin ATPases and slow calcium ATPases. So it's not a fast twitch or a slow twitch fiber. It's got the same myosin as in the fast twitch, but the same calcium pump as in the slow twitch. What will its twitch look like? On that same di on the same diagram, so starting at the same place, starting here, try sketching what that twitch would look like. Or do it the other way. What if you made one with slow myosin ATPase but fast calcium pumps? What would that twitch look like? Consider that a challenge. Think about it and bring your ideas to me, either in class or outside of class, and we'll go over them because such a question might show up on the exam. Hint, hint. Okay, so that's the idea of a single twitch. But we still haven't answered this question. How do we build, how do we have force showing up in a muscle overall? Well, that's the idea of summation and tetanus. And I think we're gonna leave that till the third part of this lecture. So I'll see you then.